Hello folks, my name is Kent Hovind. It is May 29th, 2017. And I last week did a, a long phone discussion with uh, uh, Jackson Wheat, a student at Louisiana State University. Had, uh, and we put it up on YouTube and have had many comments. Jackson uh, uh, did a wonderful job trying to defend the evolution religion, as I call it. But uh, he put up a YouTube recently, and someone called my attention to it, Reflections on my conversation with Kent Hovind. It's very short. I would like to... Uh, go through line by line and dissect what he said exactly on the, his reflections. My first reaction after seeing his short uh, uh, reflections YouTube was, Jackson, you're not getting it at all. Your thinking is, wow, how could I better present evolution? There's a whole other rabbit you need to chase. Maybe you should be thinking, you know, maybe I'm on the wrong side of this argument to begin with. <laughs> Maybe I'm trying to defend 2 plus 2 is 5, and it's not 5, and that's what I want to talk about. Okay, here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I apologize for not doing a video in so long, but college gets in the way of everything. Anyways, I uploaded a three-part conversation that I had with creationist Kent Hovind over the phone, and I wanted to take time to go through some things. I'll talk about some things I did wrong, some things I can work on in the future, and some claims I didn't get to respond to given the nature of our conversation. So let's dive right in. To begin, I want to point out that the conversation was very respectful, which I suppose is the most important aspect of it, and this fact was noticed by numerous people in the comment section of his videos. Well, thank you so much, Jackson. I think you were very respectful also, and I appreciate that. I think if you watch any of my debates, I've done 100, about 120 of them now, I think I'm respectful uh, in all of them. I think if you read the comments and watch the reaction of some of the atheist revolutionists, they are not very respectful. So I very much appreciate your, um, your, your being respectful in this, and we can do it again anytime you want, okay? Anytime. Just, you know, name the time and place and let's do it. Uh, if you can get any other evolutionist or atheist or anybody uh, who d disagrees with the creation story, uh, let's have another debate. Uh, I won't do it one-on-one -on -one or nobody's going to watch it, but if everybody's going to see it and profit from it, I'll be glad to do it again. I have a tendency to become somewhat heated in conversations like these with other people, generally when they occur in person, but this encounter was very calm, for which I am thankful. All right, it sounds very much, Jackson, like you're reading this, which is fine. <clears throat> Just so folks are aware, <clears throat> I'm not reading anything. This is all impromptu for me, not that that's good or bad, just a fact. Uh, so, yes, I think it was very respectful, and there's no need for conversations to get heated. I am for truth and against error, that's all. If the truth leads to evolution being true, I'll follow it, but I don't think it leads there. And so uh, I just want the truth exposed and, uh, and error exposed. Now, without further ado, what did I get wrong? My most important mistake was having this conversation over the phone. However, I could not have known that in advance. The reason this was such a pivotal mistake is that Hovind had total control over the medium at all times. So... Now, hold on, Jackson. That is simply not true. You called me and started this, and I asked after you called me if I could record the conversation, and we started over. So it was your choice to do the phone. I didn't have control over this. You got to talk as much as I did. You had control over what you said, and none of I had no preparation time at all for this. And by the way, the picture you have of me is somebody put up a reverse image. I part my hair on the right, and that one has it parted on the left, so somebody reversed the picture years ago, and it still circulates around the web, so minor detail, but fix that if you could. Um, so no, you didn't. It wasn't that you didn't have control over the situation. Uh, you you could say whatever you wanted. I think we went an hour and a half. I gave you plenty of time, all the time I had, and we can do it again if you'd like. So I, I have to disagree with your comment there, Jackson. You had control of your side. Now, if you're feeling bad because most people are commenting that you lost, I don't think it's because you weren't in control. I think it's because you're on the wrong side of the argument. Evolution is stupid. It doesn't happen. It's a religion. That's why. And I can only speak when he allowed. Oh, uh, that's not true. You spoke as much as you wanted. You didn't speak when I allowed. I did stop you and, and from going on with, you accuse me in a minute of doing the gish gallop. It's you that does that, uh, as we'll see here. But <clears throat> uh, no, you could talk about any topic you wanted, ask any questions you wanted, make any statements, but I want to stop line by line and dissect it. That's all. That's perfectly reasonable. So no, this is not true so far about me controlling the conversation. Uh, I just, I don't want people to slip in lies and move on with something else, and that often happens in these discussions on evolution. 
they'll make a statement on one topic that isn't true and then move off to something else and, and leave that statement hanging. And I don't, I don't want that. Let's go line by line. You can do that with me. If he wanted me to stop, then he could make me do so with ease. Perhaps? Uh, I don't think the phone or Skype or anything would make any difference there. I think I've always said for all my debates, I want one. You can have ten against one, but I want one topic at a time. Discuss. I get half the time, and we talk about one topic at a time. Perfectly reasonable. Perhaps if I have another conversation with them, I should do it via Skype. Or All right, Jackson, I have a Skype interview in 15 minutes uh, here from the or 20 minutes here from the uh, office, and we can do it anytime you'd like. I don't think Skype's going to help. You're on the wrong side of the argument. Is the problem? We could have time to talking periods. That said, he did let me air a good number of my points, and I feel that if someone came to the conversation looking to learn, then they probably did learn something. I agree. I think a lot of people learned a lot of things. I think they learned that evolution cannot be defended. It's not viable. Two plus two is five. Cannot be defended, logically. Another mistake that I made was to use the word information while talking about genetics. I did define the word as what I expect it to mean with regard to genetics. That is, to me, information should mean protein coding genes. And I asked Hogan what he meant when he used the word. He never gave me a response. Well, now, hold on a minute. Inf the genes do code information. How else can you say it? Just like a computer code that your computer is running, any computer program is running line after line after line of information. Uh, I disagree, Jackson. Now, come on. Let's have this debate again. You can call in. you got my cell phone number. And we'll do it again and record it. There's nothing wrong with the word information. The DNA code contains enormous amounts of information. That little code tells you what color your hair is going to be and what color your eyes are going to be and each of the muscles in your body and the digestive system and the skeletal system. It is phenomenal amount of information. There's nothing wrong with that word. However, I should have avoided the word anyway because it lends itself to equivocation. Next, what can I work on in the future? Clearly, I let Hogan pull me around way too much. Oh. Now, come on now, Jackson. I didn't pull you around. I stopped you when you tried to go off to other topics and let's, no, let's settle this. I think you have been taught some things at your university that are simply not true. You have chosen to believe them as true and have determined to defend this and it's just not common sense. In the future, you can come back as often as you'd like for round two, round three, round four. We'll go as long as you'd like. But I'm not going to let, I didn't lead you around. You picked the topic. You you are the ones asking the questions. You're the one leading the conversation. <laughs> so this is not true, Jackson. I would make a point, and he would then gish gallop to 10 different topics. Let me explain what this gish gallop is. There was a, a man named Dwayne Gish, a famous creation scientist from years ago. He and Henry Morris kind of revived this creation science movement in the early 60s with their book, I think it was called The Genesis Record or something. Anyway, I, I've met Dwayne Gish a couple of times. I uh, didn't know him real well. But he started the organization Institute for Creation Research, ICR, which is now in Dallas, Texas. And Gish has done, I think, over 300 debates. I believe he's dead now, but he did many debates, uh, about 300 of them, with atheists. And they would accuse him of doing the Gish Gallop, which means let's mention 10 topics and run off and the atheist said, I don't get time to answer them all. When exactly the opposite is true. It was the evolutionists doing what they call the Gish Gallop and what you tried to do a dozen times in our discussion mention something and go off to something else before I get time to respond. It's you doing the gish gallop, not me. I'll slice, slice it up as thin as you want. We'll go one topic at a time. For example, someone in the comment section noted that when I talked about beneficial mutations, Hoven would take the conversation to abiogenesis. Now hold it. When you talk about beneficial mutations, I talked about beneficial mutations and said, show me one. But then I would say something to the effect of, this idea of beneficial mutations, cha changes within a certain kind of animal, is only a small slice of a much bigger picture. And abiogenesis, the origin of life from non-living material, is an essential part of evolution theory. And the six stages I give of evolution are, the atheists all hate it because it exposes so clearly the stupidity of their religion. You have to have time, space, matter come into existence. That's number one, cosmic evolution. You have to have the uh, stars forming. You have to have all the elements forming. You have to have life get started from non-living material, what you call abiogenesis. If not, what's going to evolve that is part of the theory? Read the textbooks. That's what my gripe is. This is what we're teaching the kids. Now, the, of course, when you get them in a corner, the evolutionists want to say, well, that's, we're just talking about variation within the gene code. 
well, that's not what your books do, and it's not what you do in a classroom, <clears throat> only when they're caught under pressure that they say, well, this is really not part of evolution, when it is an essential part of evolution. As if one necessitates the other. <coughs> now, that wouldn't be my fault if I just stuck to one topic, keeping him on that topic when he tried to gish gallop away. Okay, now, I, I resent that. I did not. I will stick on any one topic you want. Jackson, call me anytime. You got my cell phone number. Let's do this again. And I promise you, it'll be you that does the gish galloping. I'm not afraid of any of the topics the evolutionists can bring up. You want to talk about one specific one? Let's narrow it way down and talk about it. I will, if you want to talk about gene mutation or something, we can talk about that. But I would point out to the listening audience that this is a small slice of a much bigger picture. This would be like pointing out a design flaw in the Chevy van and say, look at this, this is a design flaw here. Therefore, nobody built the van. Oh, I said, come on now, hold it. It's true, Chevy made a mistake on this, or this is something degenerated, but that's not, you're missing the bigger picture. The van was designed. And I think what you do is you focus on a little tiny thing, a mutation of some kind, and miss the giant picture. You can't see the forest because the trees are blocking your view. However, I didn't. That way, Hogan was also in control of the conversation because he could tailor whatever we talked about so that it sounded as though he was always right. Well. Could it be, uh, if even considered the option that maybe I was right on those points and maybe you were wrong, it wasn't a gish gallop at all. And as I said, I resent you saying that. It's you that did it over and over. Go back and listen to it yourself. Another way he did that was while we were talking about mutations, he said something to the effect of, that doesn't prove a frog could turn into a prince. That again, uh, Jackson, is me showing the audience, the listening audience, because thousands have watched this now, the bigger picture. A mutation within the same kind of animal, blonde hair, gray hair, blue hair, or blue eyes, etc., that is just a small slice of a really big picture that you want to get all the people to swallow, which is that a frog turned to a prince over billions of years. That is exactly what the evolution theory teaches. Now, knock it off. Clearly, this is a red herring, and fortunately, <coughs> I didn't respond to that specific claim. Okay, respond anytime you want, Jackson. It is part of the problem that the evolutionists will give examples of microevolution and try to make their people believe that this is somehow evidence of a bigger picture when it is not at all. And I was simply constantly keeping this in focus. It's not a red herring. <clears throat> not trying to draw your attention off on something else. I was trying to keep people's attention focused. I think all the little minor mutations they give uh, is the red herring, as if that's somehow supposed to prove that we all came from Iraq 4.6 billion years ago, which is exactly what evolution says. Read the textbooks. I'll show you. Watch my video number four where I show it right from the books. His audience, though, would perceive that as being a necessary and correct outcome of my position. That is, if beneficial mutations exist, then a frog must have evolved into a human. No. I do believe mutations exist by the millions. I said, I think I said it. Go back and watch it. I'm not aware of any beneficial ones. If there's something that appears to be beneficial on the surface, that doesn't mean it really is. It may have some other deleterious effect somewhere else. And ultimately, you have to get frogs or something to turn into a human. That's what your theory is all, that's what it's all about. Trying to explain man without God. That's the whole purpose. It's like finding a painting on a tree in the woods and trying to explain it without using man as your answer. That's what all of is. Evolution is a way to run and hide from the creator concept. That's all it is. Royalty or not. I'm not going to get into why this is wrong because I feel that my audience is intelligent enough to understand the problem, so I'll move on. Oh, uh, now hold on. Don't, don't just move, gish gallop on that one. Your audience is intelligent enough. Is that implying that my audience is not intelligent? Uh, that seems to be the implication there. I think anybody that watched our discussion is intelligent enough to say, whoa, wait a minute. This is not, what, what uh, Jackson is saying isn't right. I simply pointed out the errors in, the, 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 in, your, in your logic. You would see a little micro mutation and then jump to some giant conclusion. That's, that you gotta slow down and look at this piece by piece. It's not evidence for evolution. So you're the one guilty of this. I can also work on my speaking abilities in the future because I talk a lot slower than Hope. That's not going to help at all, Jackson. Talk as fast as you want, talk as slow as you want. You're on the wrong side of the argument. You're defending the wrong thing. Talking fast, talking slow is not going to help defending 2 plus 2 is 5. It's not 5. You're wrong. There is no evolution other than variations within the same kind of animal. 
So your speaking ability was not the problem. I think you did very well for a college student. I've done like 120 of these debates, and you did very well trying to defend a really dumb idea. Logan does. The reason for this is, as was pointed out to me later, that he has had decades more experience in this than I have. Hoven knows a lot of the arguments for evolution, but he has also read many Answers in Genesis, Institute for Creation Research, and Discovery Institute articles criticizing evolution. Okay, now hold it. First of all, what is wrong with that? I think you should study both sides. I'll read anything the evolutionists put out. I read stuff the creationists put out. I think you should do the same thing. It looked to me like from your argument on the, on the YouTube that you've only seen the evolution side and you've been indoctrinated into believing that's true. <clears throat> So you didn't lose the debate because I read creationist articles. You read the debate, you lost the debate because you're on the wrong side. Evolution it didn't happen, it's not true. So reading these other uh, articles from these institutions, etc., is not good or bad. I do read a lot of their stuff and I appreciate other people doing research. I think anyone involved in any field of science should read, uh, read other people doing the same research. And so, and you'd do yourself some good to read some, some of these websites you mentioned are excellent, especially that bottom right hand corner. CSE Ministry, that one's ours. That's the best, of course. But read it. These organizations are almost unanimously wrong on almost all points, but they. Now, stop right there. That is so cruel to say such a thing. Just to blanketly say these organizations are wrong on everything. Come on, grow up, Jackson. That's not common sense. Just a blanket statement. They're wrong. Be specific. I'd like you to show some specifics where they're wrong, and if somebody's wrong on one point, but they've made 10,000 points, like most of these ministries have, that doesn't prove they're wrong on all points. If I make a mistake in my speaking, which I have made plenty of, that doesn't prove I'm wrong on everything. That's not logic, Jackson. Come on. I still reach a wide audience, including Hogan. Fortunately, there are many YouTubers out there who critically evaluate Hogan's arguments and can reasonably show why they're incorrect. Okay, now show me a specific. You, I don't know who the picture of this guy is, but I'll be glad to take on any YouTuber or any professor, if it's a public debate, and show me specifically. That's like one guy on the internet now saying, Hovind's a liar, Hovind's a liar. Which lie? Well, he's just a liar. I debated uh, Karen Bartelt at uh, Bradley University. The debate was held at a Unitarian church in Peoria, Illinois. It's one of my debates in my series there. And she kept using this. She said, there's just so much evidence for evolution. There's so much. Okay, like, show me one. Oh, there's, there's just so much. Show me one. You show me one time where I lied or made a mistake, and I'll correct it. But even if you do, that doesn't mean everything else is a lie or a mistake. Don't do that, Jackson. Come on. One such as Tony Reed, who runs the video series How Creationism Taught Me Real Science. Okay, I've never heard of this guy you just mentioned. I don't know who he is. I've not read his, seen his YouTube or read anything he wrote. But you tell Tony, call me, you've got my number, give it to him, please, and say, Tony, let's do this line by line with Kent on the on the internet. We'll do more YouTubes on exa what exactly are his complaints. If he's doing a YouTube about me and not giving me a chance to respond, I think that's unfair. You, you can respond to this YouTube I'm doing. You can call me anytime. We'll do another one. I'll go in front of any university and take on Tony or any or all the atheists in the world with half my brain tied behind my back. So, uh, so somebody's... Just because, some people think just because they talked, they answered the question. You see this in courtrooms all the time. Just because this guy, Tony, whoever he is, made a, made a YouTube or made a series about me without me there to defend myself does not mean he's right or that he even answered the, the points. So uh, you tell him, I'll do a debate with him anytime, anywhere. Three-fourths of my brain tied behind my back, and I've never met the guy. Many of the arguments he looks at are actually Hovind's. So reads a good source for understanding and debunking creationist arguments. Okay, let's go specifically, one by one. What specifically has he debunked? I'd like to see that. Now, let's look at the points I wanted to make, but, given the nature of our conversation, did not. The first thing that was difficult in the conversation was to pin Hoven down on definitions. No, that was difficult to pin you down, Jackson. What exactly is a species? What exactly do you mean by that word evolution? Define those very carefully for me where we can dissect them. What exactly is a species and what exactly does the word evolution mean? And if it does not include the other six, the six meanings that I give it, I clearly defined it. I said this word has six different meanings or levels or stages. I do this every time I speak on the topic. I clearly defined it. For example, 
Even though I explained that there are certain mutations in humans that are beneficial without any harmful side effects, Hoven wouldn't say they were beneficial. Because, Jackson, you don't know that there's no side effects. I pointed out that if something happens, that's a mutation, that someone looks at it and says, aha, this is beneficial, I think it takes a whole lot more study to determine if it really is. Example I give in my seminar, if they're going around handcuffing people to haul them off to prison to kill them, and somebody doesn't have any arms, aha, they can't handcuff him. Ah, look at that, a beneficial mutation. No, it's still not beneficial to not have arms. And I am unaware of any beneficial mutations, A, that don't have any deleterious effects somewhere else, and B, who's this going to marry, and that's why I pointed that out, how's this going to get passed on in the gene code, and how three, this, co this uncovers a whole philosophy that, ah, the better ones should live and the other ones should die. This is Adolf Hitler 101. Let's get the beneficial, the mutated Aryan race and let them survive. I just pointed out the philosophical problems with going down this rabbit trail at all. So if you have a beneficial mutation that you think is going to lead to changing a frog to a prince, or ultimately a rock to a prince, I'd like to see it, but I pointed out it would take trillions, quadrillions, quintillions of these so-called beneficial mutations, and the evolutionists are scraping the barrel to find one. Mutations. The reason for this is, I think, that creationists aren't allowed to admit when a beneficial mutation is observed. So no matter how good a mutation is, they will never say that it's beneficial. Hold it. You say creationists aren't allowed to admit. Nobody tells me what to say or do. I, I'm allowed to say whatever I want so far in America. That This is not correct, Jackson. Now, come on, you need to correct that statement, okay? I don't work for any of those ministries you mentioned. I work for the Lord as best I know how. I'm honest and fair as best I know how. And what do you mean aren't allowed to admit? I haven't seen one. Here you are in your mind. You think there are beneficial mutations. I don't. And therefore, you think I'm being controlled by somebody else. No, I'm not being controlled by anybody else. Show me which beneficial mutation you're talking about. You and me, man on man, doesn't need to be anybody else involved. He even said that mutations weren't incremental, but surely he should know that they are. I asked for an example. You want one beneficial mutation and then another one and another one incrementally build up to something else. This is fairy tale stuff, Jackson. You're imagining it happening, but it doesn't happen in reality. It all takes place on paper, in the textbook, and in the mind of the deluded evolutionist. That's the only place it actually takes place. He should know that neutral mutations occur in everyone shortly after conception, and that these don't keep us from finding someone to marry, as he said. Well, I pointed out the mutations, if you marry too close to your own bloodline, may create a problem, which is why it's illegal in all but three states to marry closer than a first cousin or second cousin, because of this problem. Cats and dogs have this all the time. They marry back to their own family and end up with six toes or seven toes or more schizo than normal in the, shape, in the case of the cat. So I think go back and watch what I said on that. I think I did very well defending that point. Hogan also wouldn't accept my definitions for evolution or macroevolution. That's because, Jackson, you keep trying to slip in stuff. You, you give examples of variations within the genetic code. Okay, well, that doesn't explain where this code came from to begin with, how any variations happen, and are they beneficial, and who's it going to marry, and how this ties into the big philosophical picture of everybody else has to die now to make this really work. Ultimately, you have to have this over billions of years. And Anyway, go ahead. The definition I gave for evolution is genetic change in a population over time. Okay, stop right there. That assumes... The population is already there, so you're starting with a created creature, or with a creature of some kind. You're assuming that these variations can add up. What you mention here, and even your picture showing these creatures here, doesn't happen in reality. It's only imagination. And this is why I pointed out that every farmer of everything, from cows to corn, counts on evolution not happening. Sure, he gets a variety, but if it's too far away from the norm, it's usually sterile, or detrimental to the to this to the uh, population. And macroevolution is defined <clears throat> as genetic change at or above the level of species. Okay. Did you give me any examples of that, Jackson? You gave me no examples of macroevolution above the level of species, and you didn't clearly define what a species is. It's you that's not defining stuff. I gave a clear definition. I think what's falsely or sadly called microevolution happens. There's all kinds of varieties. There's big dogs and little dogs. 
and they've been trying to get smaller dogs because somebody wants to buy the dumb little teacup poodle, okay, they'll never get a dog as small as a flea or a microbe. It never will. There are living things as small as a microbe, like a microbe, but that does, why, don't, can't, why can't they get a dog that small? The, the, my point would be, sure, variations happen, but they're limited, and most of the ones we see today are induced by man or selected by man. Natural selection would select those that survive in nature. That's what it's all about. That doesn't add up to anything above in what you call macroevolution. You need to clearly define the terms and let's discuss them. And if you want to start with species already or a population already existing, then I'm going to object and say, hold it. How did that population come to be? And they're going to say, well, that's a different argument. Okay, well, then let's take it out of the textbooks until it's proven. If that's really a different argument, and that's not part of evolution, then help me get that out of the textbooks, because it is in the textbooks. However, he insisted that species isn't a good word to use. I think that in general, it's a good word to use, and the biological species concept is defined as organisms that can mate and produce fertile offspring are one species. Okay, we did talk about that. I said a, a horse and a zebra can interbreed. They are different species, but they can interbreed. The Bible gives a pretty simple way to tell. It says that they will bring forth after their kind. If they're capable of bringing forth offspring, they're the same kind of animal. That's real simple definition of what a kind is. Are they able to bring forth? A horse and a butterfly cannot produce babies. A horse and a banana cannot produce babies. A horse and a zebra can. Aha, well, maybe that's the same kind. Now, we'd also have to look at this argument and say this was created 6,000 years ago. Have there been changes to the point where they now can no longer interbreed? A Great Dane and a Chihuahua might have a hard time, uh, depending on which one's the male. Or in both cases, they'd have a hard time. So this is, but they're still, they're still a dog. So are they still biologically capable of bringing forth? Maybe. And I said, that's a great field of research. What exactly is the kind? That's what baromenology is all about. But your definition of species doesn't hold water because some animals that are different species by your definition can reproduce viable offspring. Sure, there are problems with this definition, but as far as our conversation went, it was an acceptable word to use. Because it's not clearly defined. Problem. You said there's problems with the definition. Obviously, you're reading from a script here. Um, I agree. There are real problems with the definition. That's why I don't think you should go on and build a whole lifestyle and build a whole eternity uh, based on something as, as shaky as that word species. And if we see what somebody considers a new species created, don't think that that somehow adds up to something else. It never has. Of course. While he had problems with the word species, he had no problem using the word kind, which is totally without definition. No, I gave a clear definition. If they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Plus, most of it is just plain common sense. Hey, check on the Skype interview I'm supposed to do right now. Would you and see what, what the holdup is on that? Ah. His only defense of using the word was that more scientific research should be put into understanding it. No, that is not true. I didn't say that's my only defense of using the word. I said... The biblical word kind is great, and I think we should do more research on defining exactly what is a kind, and there have been books been written about that, uh, about baromenology. Somebody sent me one last week. I'm sitting on the, I don't, haven't read it yet, but, so I, I did. That's not the only, only reason you gave there. If kind does accurately reflect some real-world biological relationship, then let's use it. However, if it has no definition, then it can't be used to make a point about biology. Well, but then the ditto for the species. And, I was, and I'm not asking for my teaching to be taught at taxpayer expense. You are. Uh, That's putting the cart before the horse. I could talk about kinds more, but I already made a video about it titled Impossible Baromenology. Then we started to talk about how science works. I've not seen your video on Impossible Baromenology. I will have to look at that. I don't know where it is. We got to see it. Oh, yeah, inference to show him that inference is no really less scientific than observation or experimentation, but he gish galloped again, taking me with him. Okay, hold it. First of all, I did not gish gallop. I tried to hold you on point. Inference does not carry the same weight as observation. In any court of law, there are different levels of uh, uh, evidence carries different weight. Uh, in medical field, we see that all the time, where a doctor sees red spots on the patient. Okay, we can all see the patient has red spots. That is observation. One doctor infers <clears throat> that it is a certain disease. He may or may not be right. How many people have been wrongly treated for a disease because they made the wrong inference? So 
No, I'm simply pointing out, before you gish gallop off on something else, that inference does not carry the same weight as observation. And in forensic science and medical science, many things are inferred, and people are going to jail because they made the wrong inference from the evidence. They see the evidence and infer George did it, and he didn't do it. But he goes to jail over that. So be cautious, and, <clears throat> and you have inferred many things about evolution that are not part of observational science. And I didn't gish gallop anywhere. I think I could point it out, at least to the audience, the importance of inference in forensic science, leading some of them to understand that inference can be helpful in uncovering the truth about our past. I agree. Inference can be very helpful. I'm not saying it's completely useless, but it can be wrong, and it is not the same weight as uh, real uh, observational evidence. The last point I wanted to make concerned unicellularity to multicellularity. Hovind asked me to provide him with an example of a unicellular organism becoming multicellular, and I was going... Okay, you show a, a, a phylogenetic tree here. None of those lines connecting these different kinds actually exist in nature. This is somebody with a hyperactive ink pen drawing lines that do not exist in reality. We do not know that any of these creatures are related. We see everything producing after its kind. Every type of bacteria, fungi produce fungi. Plants produce plants. Ciliates produce ciliates. They have lines connecting them back to a common ancestor. The line is not science. It's not even good inference. But at best, it is inference. It is not observable science. <clears throat> the fact that somebody has a good ink pen and can draw lines on a piece of paper does not prove common ancestor point out that numerous experiments have yielded unicellular organisms colonializing, like the elk. Numerous experiments have got unicellular organisms colonizing, but that's a far cry from a new organ functioning like a liver or a stomach or an intestine or an eyeball. Algae chlorella vulgaris. However, he said to give him an example where they went straight to multicellularity, bypassing the colonial stage. Oh, I did not say they go straight to multicellular. I don't think the colonial stage can, has never been demonstrated to go to a multi to a, a animal with different tissues and organs. You can infer that if you want and believe that if you want, which is what I pointed out a hundred times in our discussion. It's a religion. It's not observable science. So yes, different species, different bacteria and unicellular creatures colonize that the American colonies formed, they didn't turn them all into one human being. They're still individual human beings forming a colony. I was going to say that that's not how multicellularity arises, but I was... Multicellularity doesn't arise. It doesn't happen. You're dreaming that it happens. Let away again. Anyways, the conversation was interesting and, more importantly, respectful. Thus, I feel that I should have made some sort of impact on some of his viewers. If your goal, Jackson, is to make an impact on my viewers, I think you're back to missing the big picture here. You are determined to defend what you already believe. You apparently are not willing to consider that maybe what you believe is wrong. And it is wrong. But you're determined to defend that and determined to convert some of my viewers over to believing like you. Well, go ahead. Good luck with that one. I appreciate your honesty there, and I wish all public school teachers and university classes would have somebody like me come in and talk to their students so they can see both sides. I think students should see both sides of this argument to make an intelligent decision on what they choose to believe. The problem is the evolution side looks real stupid next to the creation side, and that's why they don't want people like me coming into their classroom because I make them look like fools, because they are a fool if they believe they came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. There's no kind way to say it. A person that believes that is a fool. Humorously, some of the comments are people saying that I won, and while I don't think I won our conversation, I find it funny that some people think I did. I find it very funny also, Jackson. I don't think you won. I think you lost big time. I think it clearly exposed to most thinking people that what you believe is incorrect. Now, I, I don't question that you really believe it. I think you really do believe what you believe. I think you're honest and sincere and dedicated. So are the Muslims. So are the Mormons. So are the Catholics. That doesn't prove right or wrong in any argument. Okay? You, <clears throat> did, as, you did as well as anybody could have done presenting a really dumb theory. I don't think there's a kind way to produce, uh, to, to promote a, a dumb theory like that.
At any rate, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. All right, thank you so much. And Jackson, you call me anytime. Hello, everyone, and welcome oh, back. Hang on. Sorry, I'll start it again. Jackson, you've got my cell phone. Call me anytime. We'll do another one, another YouTube, or get some professors to help you. Get all your ducks in a row if you can line them up, and we'll do it again. But folks watching my channel, the Kent Hovind Official, or watching my uh, uh, debates on YouTube or on my website, drdino.com, you can call 855-BIG-DINO and get all of my materials. You're welcome to copy it, but don't sell it and don't edit it. Uh, if you don't sell it and don't edit it, you can copy it. Some folks have been copying it and selling it, and that's illegal. Don't do that. That's my intellectual property. But you're welcome to copy it and give it away to people. Now, if I can help in any way, call 855-BIG-DINO, and I'll be glad to answer any questions I can. 855-244-3466. If you have someone who believes in evolution, and an emphasis is on the word believe, not accepts evolution, anyone who believes in evolution, I'll be glad to do another debate anytime. You just tell them. Give me a call. Let's book them. Now, you're going to die one day, and I'm going to die one day. Where are you going? If you are just a collection of chemicals that formed by chance over billions of years, you have nothing to worry about. You're going to turn back to stardust. But what if it's not true? What if there is a God? What if he did create and did it for a reason? And what if he made some rules? Like, you know, thou shalt not. And what if you broke those rules? Now what? The Bible teaches we are created by God. He did make rules, and we did break his rules, and he's going to be our judge, and we're in trouble. But fortunately, he loves us. Hence, he came down himself and became a man, Jesus Christ, allowed them to crucify him so his death can pay for our sins. And 48 years ago, I said, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I believe you died for me. Would you please forgive me and save me? I turned, which is what the word repent means, I turned from my disbelief to believing and accepted what he did for me. And you can do the same thing right now. There's no magic prayer, but you could pray something like this. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner. I have broken your laws. I'm guilty. But I believe you died on that cross for me and you rose from the dead. Lord Jesus, would you please move into my heart and save me, forgive me, make me your child right now. The Bible says when you receive him, you get born again, John chapter 3. You become a child of God, John chapter 1. That's how you get born again, by receiving Christ. Watch our videos. If we can help, give us a call. If you have not accepted Christ, do it today. You're going to die someday and be dead for a really long time. You don't want to be going to the wrong place. Thanks for joining us. Talk to you later. Bye.